Thanks, Valent. Thanks for joining our show. Thanks um, for having me. Absolutely. Always fun to have, uh, you know, people that I've worked with before as well. So that's always an interesting bit. And uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, just tell us about yourself, like your, your name. Uh, why are you in London to begin with? And we'll see, we'll see how I go with that. So I'm, I'm, I'm Valent. Moved to London about 11 years ago. You know, just as a little bit of an adventure for a couple of years. I thought I'll stay a year or two. And then here I am 11 years later. So I kind of enjoyed my time, I guess. You know, London's a good place. Well, you place, say enjoy, so but I feel here. like you're still enjoying it there. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I'm, I actually lived a year in the in the middle of those 11 years in, in Asia, in Singapore. But after about a year, I came back. I, you know, I don't know. For London, a reason. London's been pretty good. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing. You could have, you could have went back to, I mean, originally from Hungary. You could have went back to Hungary, but something, I guess, something just drew you back into the city, I guess, at that point. Well, I think there's a very few places like London, maybe New York, maybe Hong Kong is or was like that, but it's a very like multicultural place, right? And I think when we talk about, you know, well-being or level of wealth or how good is it to be in a place, maybe London is expensive or, you know, salaries are not as high as in the valley or whatever, but I think people don't consider the, the quality of like the quality of your social interactions into your quality of life. So in London, you meet all sorts of different people with their own kind of thoughts and culture. And it's just every day is fun. Every day you meet different people and you learn about different things. And it's very hard to meet so many different people in one place, right? Exactly. And I think one of the, one of the good points is that like, I've noticed is that like you, I mean, London would be the middle ground of you still being back home and like still being in Europe. I mean, temporarily for now, <laughs> still being in Europe, but you don't have to travel like if ever you move to like San Francisco, for example, you'll probably if you want to go back home, you have to travel like 16, 12 hours on the, on the plane. I just figured that out. So I do get the appeal of London, which is kind of, I guess, kind of the same for me at this point, because I I'm originally from Canada and my parents are from Hong Kong. So for some reason, London is right in between those two. So I mean, I, I'm pretty sure like if you lived in like Seattle or something, it would be closer to both, right? It wouldn't. I mean, yeah, to be fair though, like Vancouver, <laughs> Seattle, that would be, that'd be technically true. But then yeah, again, Hong like, Kong wouldn't be too far either. You just, you know. Yeah, because it's definitely on yeah, the other side. Yeah, of just it. the other way. But, uh, the thing is, one thing I, I kind of want to see is that, like, did you decide to move to London or did it just, as in, like, how, how did you, how do you, like, it's more like a, your history. How did you even manage to get an opportunity in London or was it you just jumped, jump right into it did well, you have I, a purpose coming in i was in, just or? young and naive and i thought like hey i have a degree from hungary from whatever university nobody ever heard of i did a year's worth of work and i speak english as well i'm sure if i go to london i you know people throw jobs at me and that 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 probably wasn't exactly the case for multiple reasons maybe that's because not how things generally happen but also <laughs> because i came in october 2008 like just did the you know, this, this peak of this credit crunch thing and jobs weren't oh, yeah, exactly genius, yeah. uh, plentiful. So it was a bit of a rough start with some, some, you know, less exciting work at the beginning. But eventually, like, you know, if you push for long enough, you'll, you'll get some sort of a, a job in your profession and well, you, I mean, look at you now though i mean we'll get, it, we'll get into that though we'll get into well, it but. you make it sound much better than what it is but yeah no, oh, I, man. I, well you need yeah. somebody to say it so i'm there for that and also you had an opportunity to give a shout out to your university and you didn't do it which is why i think my university got acquired by another university i don't even know who, who, who oh, where do i hold my degree at it wasn't a great university no it was just a, okay it's average in hungarian terms so i'm not gonna give a shout out now okay but <laughs> It also proves the point that, like, sometimes you don't really need an amazing university to get to where it's you're a at. Very interesting topic, especially if we talk about software engineering, but any other profession, to be honest. Well, not any, most. But uh, you go to university for what, four or five years and, and you actually get a job. You, at best, use 10 to 20% of what you studied there for five years. So by that notion, if you go take on some underpaid work experience for a year, you probably learn better and faster. So I think in software engineering or some of these more practical business studies, you're actually better off like getting into a job and, and or maybe try to use your personal time to develop yourself. But then again, I probably want a surgeon who finished medical school and not just <laughs> like, you know, self-thought surgeon, which would probably sure not like that? operate. So I think that, that, that there are exceptions like lawyers and surgeons, but it's quite interesting, these uh, um, software development boot camps, right? These like three months uh, courses that actually make you like a very entry level software engineer in three months. So if you assume you go for computer science for five years, then you could do this three months course, get into an entry level job, probably not a great one, but then you have another four years and nine months to actually develop yourself into a proper software engineer. 
And I bet you in anything that if you do that, then in five years, you'll be a much better, much more like usable employee than you'd be right out of a computer science degree from whatever university. I like, okay, so I've spoken to so many people about this topic and I'm kind of definitely on your fence where it's like, for me, university is obviously um, very, very, you know, controversial. It's controversial, controversial in terms of how expensive it is, how much time you got to put into it. And then obviously your example where you're saying, oh, but instead of doing those, what, three, four, five years of it and, and you just go in to get work experience, it's much worth it. I'm definitely more on that side. I'm on the bit where it's I mean, like... I mean, these boot camps are like 10 grand for three months. So I wouldn't say they, they much cheaper. Obviously, they give you like a loan as well, like a student loan type of arrangement with some sort of like private financial company. And then they take it off from your salary or whatever for the next couple of years. So they do the same yeah. thing, right? But they just I mean, give you not like a broad knowledge that makes you like an actual better all round, or they just give you very speci like specific knowledge in what you're actually going to do in your job that pushes you into that role much quicker. It's tailored for that role. It's much more optimized. And that is such a good example because when you're saying it's tailored for the role, it doesn't always apply to just software engineering. For example, there's uh, one of the biggest examples you see in Canada is that when you go into um, after sixth form, as they call it, post sixth form is when you start uni or you could get this other uh, diploma called a professional diploma. And it's not a it's not a university diploma, it's not a bachelor's or anything. It's just straight up, if you want to be a uh, welder, you just go into a professional diploma of welding. Mm -hmm. Those guys, like out of out of that program, that is probably like two years instead of three, they make like 80 to 90 grand a year, as opposed to like a uni student that comes out to like, what, they'll come out 40K a year, just because they have a paper and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I guess the uni, you know, like the, the ceiling is probably much higher, right? Yeah, and, uh, I mean, obviously, that like that's a really good point that you got that the ceiling is much higher. But it's just that, like, when you have these like crazy comparisons happening, um, that I, I guess the numbers are there. The the fact that it's like on news sometimes you kind of see it. But for all the people that I know, my age, like my generation, mm -hmm. I'm I'm quite confident to say like ninety percent of people went to uni. Ninety to ninety five percent of people yeah. went to uni instead of doing these professional diplomas. And even I mean, let, let, but let's be honest, right? Uh, we probably could have got into a, a job quicker and better and more like in a more efficient way but i mean i'm pretty sure you enjoyed your time in uni as well like you had fun right so i guess it's it's you know it's a nice thing to do yeah also. i yeah i think i think a lot of it is that um it's not just what's on the paper at the end of the day if you think about it is that like okay so um for example job job applications i'm pretty sure you've seen a handful of them i've come across a couple to see yeah. whatever and a lot of them obviously are very interested to see what kind of diploma you got i think that's probably one of the key Thing that when people see is like, oh, you are a major in blah at blah. It's quite interesting. I, I don't know. I I mean, I hired for certain roles and I never really looked at it. I mean, if somebody has like a a degree from a very well known university, like one of the top ones, like yeah. I don't know Cambridge, Oxford, or whatever, or UC like Berkeley, in the US, yeah. like you get the Harvards and the Stanford and the, and the Ivy League schools. I guess you know for those you're kind of extra curious of because yeah. well. For me personally, I've never, I've never been to one of those. I've been to Cambridge, but I haven't gone there for university. And I'm quite curious of, you know, is it really that good? That's probably my personal take on it. And generally, those people tend to be really smart. But I think if you're, if you have a whatever degree that I never heard of, then, I mean, it's good. It's, it helps if you have a degree, but ultimately, I guess it's, it's, you know, it's how you can do the job that matters a lot more that's, than what, what piece of paper you have about it. Yeah, that's how I see it. That's honestly how I see it is that like, I mean, I, I'm definitely the person that I couldn't care less about where you went. Like if, if we're up to me to say, I, I mean, that's probably one of the things that I, I'll point out is that like, yeah, you, if you went to a great school, it's good that you pointed out. And the people that didn't really go to a good school, they probably wouldn't point it out either. Yeah, but, but I think it's, I don't know, I, I, I've been hiring a fair bit lately and I think it's always like, pretty far down the bottom of CVs. I don't think anybody makes a big deal out of it anymore. Even the big like investment banks and tech companies and consulting companies, they abolish their like degree requirements as well. It's like, it's a nice to have, but it's usually like equivalent experience. I think degrees probably matter when you start your job. So if you want to start with a large company and you come out from certain schools, it's much more likely they hire you. But once you have like two, three years of experience actually behind you, and, and that's maybe from a reasonably good company or you got the portfolio to show if you're a designer or you have, if you're an engineer, you got your, you know, your Git full of like pet projects or work projects or whatever. People are not going to check your degree. They're going to check what you did before. That's uh, <laughs> like, thank you for clarifying that. Cause like my whole, this whole time my mindset was that like, I'm literally just talking about students coming out of uni. Like that was yeah. my mindset was that like, okay, yeah, if you're coming out of uni, like you're basically defined by where you went. And I agree with you that like give it one or two years after. Nobody can, couldn't care less, which is, I guess, like 
kind of our position where it's like we yeah. we've done we've done jobs now and like we don't really have to think about where we went at that point i mean that's because generally also the the four or five years you spend in uni or college or whatever it's probably broadens your mind in general you are with like a like-minded relatively ambitious people um, discussing certain things and it probably evolves your thinking process more than if you did like a three months boot camp on one specific topic and then you went into a job to do that specific topic you're probably going to be an amazing hammer to to you know hammer yeah. that specific nail in there but your knowledge your, your your knowledge will not be extremely broad right yeah like, so that's probably a good thing about unis as well. Like they always say that great leaders are, you know, T-shaped, capital T-shaped in their knowledge. They're, they're very broad. They know a fair bit about every single area of the business and they have one area where they go really far deep down. That's a typical good leader, apparently. So, and I guess a uni kind of works in a similar way that it gives you a much broader knowledge and kind of thinking ability than, than a specific bootcamp or course or just gives you that one thing you can do. What, what you just described there is that, um, it's so good because in my head when you we were talking all about that, I was just thinking about PhDs. You know when you talk about like breadth of knowledge, which is the width of how much knowledge you are compared to the depth of a single specific thing. Yeah. You were talking about a CEO this whole time, but in my head, like I was just picturing like a PhD student where you have a, the depth of a specific field that they just really, I guess, know and understand. Yeah. About I it. mean that's that's another rule, I guess, when you you know if you were talking about a leader, that T shape probably makes sense. But if you want like a principal data scientist, for example, to your business, then you probably don't look for that T-shape. You probably look for somebody who's actually pretty good with your, with their maths and statistics and like whatever, like, you know, studies that they did on, on, on data science and machine learning, predictive uh, analysis and whatnot. Like, you know, it's a very specific knowledge and we, we know full well that today, that is worth a lot of money. Like, just don't even I mean, go there, but yeah. think about Cambridge Analytica and, you know, the latest, like, show on Netflix. Like, that's worth a lot of money to understand data. That's actually, oh my God. I mean, to think about it, when to say, like, it's worth a lot of money, but how much do we, do we know about data? How much, how much do we know in terms of, like, how much it's worth? If you know what I mean, like, how do you put a price tag on information? I mean, but I, I, I don't know that much about data, so it's probably yeah. a, a oh, topic. I mean, but, it was, it was but, like but, a... but how much you can sell it for, right? Yeah, that's so that... That, that's how you put the price on it, and you know, ads are a good way. And I think you know, nobody on this podcast or listening to this podcast will ever mind themselves getting uh, personalized ads instead of general ads. That's a good thing, but. You know, when it's, you know, when, when it becomes a little bit different, like when the people try to manipulate you and whatnot, uh, like this, this whole kind of Cambridge Analytica thing, then it's, it's, it's a questionable thing, but that's also worth a lot more for a business than selling you personalized ads. So it's, yeah. It's, I don't know. I, I like, I like the bit where you're saying, um, like it depends on what people are willing to pay for it. So if you just take a classic example of like, for example, a flat, like the worth of a flat is obviously depending on what other people want to pay for it. If you have somebody who wants to pay more for it, then it's probably worth more at that point. Now, mm -hmm. the question... Well, not the question. The, 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 the That's spin. why you bid for data as well, right? Like, you bid for, like, ads. You bid for keywords. So, you know, you can reach with a keyword X amount of people who are searching for that. So, you you know, that's data, and you bid for it, and the highest yeah. bidder will actually get their ads displayed. And that... Oh, my God. Like, that thing, when we're talking about, like, data and people competing for it and then you have Google dominating all of that and Facebook is a really close second to dominating this competitive auction where you just try to get the mm. words in there. Um, that That is a spin of it. The other spin of that I was thinking about was that like uh, you could put a price tag on data depending on how much it's worth but you have uh, on the other side these um, gov government officials, government bodies that say you shouldn't be selling of them. As in like imagine if one day the government was like you're not allowed to sell any flats. You're flat, um, like, how, are, how are, you talk, are you, are you like pushing me towards the Chinese, like people scoring kind of like news where, you know, if you like the CCTV identifies you not just from your face with facial recognition, but by your silhouette, how you're walking. Apparently they can identify you. Wait, what and is, it, what is this thing? Like I apparently in China, like I think in Beijing or whichever city does like okay, shitloads of CCTV why. and, and they, they, they are now capable of identifying people by the way they walk, not just by their face. And then apparently if you do like, I don't know, illegal things like jaywalking, you get like minus points and eventually if you Oh, social drop, credit point. Yeah, yeah the social credit it, system. And, and if you drop in like low enough, you can't buy flights and you can't do certain things. Like, I don't know if that's actually true. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I have a score or not, but I mean, that's not happening in the Western world at the moment, I would hope. But yeah, that's a very interesting like 
Do you want it to happen? I don't know, post-apocalyptic view of how data can be used. No, I don't want it to happen. I mean, it... I, um, the thing is, like, it's never a yes or no question. And I kind of like, um, I mean, if you put it as a yes or no, I don't think anybody wants it. But there's equivalent that are happening at the moment. For example, when you have credit scores, it's, it's somewhat, it's an indicator of stuff that you can or cannot do, for example. As in, like, when you have the social credit system going on in, in China and all that, it's because they, you know, if you identify these kind of thing, oh, you can't have a job because you're doing this kind of stuff, or you can't benefit from these benefits because you, you've done this. Credit score is kind of the same thing. You can't, like, what? You can't borrow more money because you've done these kind of stuff. You haven't paid this before. And well, then, I, I, I guess so, but you can't borrow money because you're unlikely to pay it back. Yeah. You cannot... Why, why? So I jaywalked a lot, so I can't buy a flight ticket. And there's a little <laughs> less connection there, right? But either way, like I, don't, I mean, I, I yeah, don't know. the comparison is not exactly like the best comparison. But I, 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 I get what you mean. So it's kind of like, and then you have these, um, you have these systems being imposed, and it's just like, where does it come from? Who decided that? So I feel like a lot of times that I notice when you have these stuff happening, by the time you notice it, they've been doing it for way too long. Like you know, this whole like data selling thing or whatever. The, by the time you notice it, they've been doing it for way too long at that point. And it's just like, people, I'm not saying that people are going to be okay with it, but um, the, the other thing that has been happening recently is that probably every week you'll hear, you're going to hear some breach, some kind of, oh, um, recently this got hacked. And like, what was the latest one? I think Capital One, 100 million people got their information like taken and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Are people, are people like neutral are people like take it as granted that it happens are people they don't seem to react about it as much as well i guess try to use different passwords on different websites yeah that's a good start i mean yeah that, <laughs> don't, don't don't let them save your car details yeah you know? i mean <laughs> i, I mean know. car companies are getting better at replacing yeah, cars they're kind of good at like but it's also there's going to be another like the sca or whatever like new ways of authenticate payments there's going to be two-factor authentication yeah. required for any payment from like i don't know a couple of weeks from now so that's probably gonna help a little bit yeah so we like you definitely see the importance of people they'll be spending millions on doing pre- these prevention measures and all that kind of stuff yeah um so i mean that's obviously from the corporate side or the people that are like yeah. uh the people that are responsible to providing a service and make sure yeah. they're safe and everything like going back to the the whole data collection thing or you yeah. know how we you know how how we are sold content to and adverts and and like thought leadership pieces or articles it's, it's been the same right like newspapers had like reached to certain areas to certain demography they know that i don't know in this region this type of person buys my newspaper and you could advertise for them i mean nothing really changed it's got a little bit more sophisticated okay. and a little bit more instantaneous and and i think people didn't realize that because it was I mean, newspapers didn't give you that much. I mean, Metro was free, right? And still free or, or evening standard. It's the same concept as Google. Google gives you Gmail. Just in exchange, I'm going to read all your emails and, and give you like advertising. It's the, it's, it's pretty much the same concept. It just got a bit more granular and a bit more instantaneous. But I think people are, are kind of awakening to the fact that that happens. I, I, you know, I'm a self-confessed Apple fanboy, but I do like Apple's approach to privacy as well. And I don't know, I, that's an interesting question. Would you pay like 20 pounds a month to use all the Google services if, if in exchange they, they would not process your data and wouldn't read your emails and, and, you know, store your search results against you and tag you with shitload of like data? Would you, would you actually pay 20 pounds a month for, gmail search and do- google docs and, and calendar and whatever else you use just to just to not be tracked yeah. just not to have this tag yeah. on you um i personally wouldn't as i'm like i'm kind of in the bit like i do get the benefits and all that kind of stuff and the other example that came recently was that i don't know if you heard about superhuman it's a uh it's a newer email client that people pay for so apparently most top executives use it i don't know if it's true in uh, london europe or whatever but in the americas there's this new thing called superhuman it's just basically a more efficient yeah. going through your emails kind of. It's it's basically like an app. It's a web there's, app. There's, app there's, there's, thing. there's there's loads of like uh, web based email tools that are out there that are paid for. And I don't know if the UX is the or the experience is the key differentiator. I mean, I think Gmail is relatively slick. It, you know, we all used to it. And email is kind of not the most productive communication platform anyway. Oh my God, like... But but. But the problem with Gmail, I guess, if you're a top executive, is that you kind of probably want to keep it private. So you'd, and I mean, at the end of the day, like, think about it, how much time you spend in Google search and, and Gmail and whatever. Like, somebody gives you that service, uh, and you think it's free. It's not. 
Uh, yeah. I mean, you pay for it with your data. I don't know. I have the, to... the amount of time I spend in those tools, like paying 20 bucks, like... Um, I um, have to quote somebody that... I, have, I definitely have to drop a quote from somebody that I've heard is that if you are not paying for a product, you are the product. That's definitely a way that you should see is that, it's like... A, it's an exaggerated way of saying that, yeah, they sell your data, but... Yeah. yeah, it's because, you know, at the end of the day, there's never anything for free. There's always a cost at the end. And I think it's up to every individual to make well, the decisions of... I think in startups, a growth phase, right? Like, when... Like, it's, it's a quite funny thing. When you grow, like, WhatsApp or whatever, you actually really don't didn't care about user data. All you cared about is building a, an audience. So, in yeah. the beginning of, bu- like, building a product like that, all you want to do is just a convenient, easy, and quick service so that you get hundreds of millions of people signed up. So then you can sell it to Facebook, who will then care about your data. So until then, you're fine. Like, you know, it's the same with like Monzo. And at the beginning, you get like, you know, all the benefits. You can top up with Apple Pay. It's all free. It's all great, you know. And then suddenly, like, okay, we now have a premium product that actually adds more. And by the way, you can only bank transfer in. Same with like Uber and Deliveroo and whatnot. At the beginning, they give you lots of like invite a friend and you get both of you get like tens of tens and hundreds of pounds and now if you try you get like three pounds over like 35 orders like two pence each or something ridiculously little now they built a user base there's there's no perks anymore the 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 prices go up the delivery has less service charge now they're monetizing so i like i have a bone to pick with all those examples. I remember. I remember clearly when uh, Monzo hit hit London. Basically, when Monzo yeah. was paying the gold, golden cards that was going about and everything. Yeah. And one of the biggest practicality was that um, you to top up your account, you didn't have to connect. You didn't have to do a bank transfer from your account to. Yeah. They basically did a like a, a money. They basically you they charged you, and then yeah. they just put the money on it. And they were taking it on themselves, the fees, every time that yeah. happened. They use Stripe. And, you know, Stripe is an amazing tech platform for processing payment. But it's not, not, not exactly the cheapest. And it's they lot. probably hit the volumes when I think it costed them millions just to, like, process the the amount of money going into the account. But it's But that's the fundamental issue. You give people, like, convenience and bonuses and whatnot to sign them up. And once it's they signed temporary. up, you, like, care a little less about them. And, you know, we hate, like... Oh, internet cable companies in the US and in Europe as well, because, well, they give you an amazing promotion. You sign a two year contract with Sky, and when your two year contract expires, then, then you don't notice, but they start to charge you twice as much. It's pretty much the same concept, right? Yeah. And the thing is, um, how, how does it affect you? As in, like, the, the one example I could take from Monzo is that the, the charge of payment, or whatever. I remember the day where you, I just couldn't tap anymore and just be like, oh, I just want to top my account directly from a payment. I had to connect my my bank account to it, and like every time I wanted to do it, I knew it now. Uh, that for some reason that marked me. That that was like a realization point where it's like, they, they, I just got I just got sold, man. They're like I just got sold. It was uh, all promises, all promises yeah. until they started doing that. And the other one that they promised that, um, I mean it's not a big deal, but you know when you go traveling and then you mm-hmm. got the foreign exchange or whatever. Yeah. Currently, there's what like two hundred pounds limit. They didn't mm. used to have that, and that was one of the, the appeal that you're saying. One of the features that they're gonna bring it in there. All these people. Well, are they still don't have it. a limit if you spend from your card. Like, oh yeah, true. Uh, you, yeah. you don't. I don't know uh, how often do you need cash these days and where you travel. But I mean, most countries in like Europe or whatever, most developed countries or developing countries, probably sometimes even more so, uh, they take card everywhere. So yeah. I, I don't know. I, That's actually I try not to bother taking cash. Yeah, I mean now like. Lifestyle in London, you probably don't need cash. Like, for the past, what, months or whatever, I barely took any cash. So, like, you kind of see this trend in London that it's not a thing. Yeah. But there's also societies like Tokyo, for example, very, very cash-based society. Hong yeah, Kong, true. very, very cash-based I mean, society. even just Berlin. You don't no, have to Ber- go too far. I did not know about Berlin. I've never been yeah. to Berlin. So, I've, uh, But it's just these kind of stuff where it's like, um, why? <laughs> why? Why? Why would they be so cash-based when... Tokyo, you could definitely say it's one of the more technological advanced society out there. Seoul as well, for some reason, keep on paper. Is it more tradition? Is it more... I, could... I don't know. I think I really don't know about those. I mean, I guess in Europe, is there's been a couple of countries where in that pick up on, or in that click to pick up on credit cards and yeah. they have like, you know, just you know... general different behavior. Like credit card is a I guess credit cards in general is a very American thing, and probably in the UK you adopt more American things than in other countries in Europe. One one of the thing um, about credit cards actually, when you're talking about like the European credit cards versus the American one, is that uh, in America or in Canada at least, um, every single credit card has some crazy rewards with it. So every every credit card I've had, it was at least like even the free ones, at least one percent cash back, no matter what, or it's some point system that you get like free stuff over yeah. time. 
And then like some some of them are outrageous. You get like four percent for if you spend gas on it with your credit card, you get four percent every time. You don't hear. I don't hear about any of this stuff in the UK. Like I, well, there's, there's, I think yeah. most of them do. Like I think you either get to a to a credit card that gets you points and like these type of systems with every bank, or you go for a for a credit card that gets you like uh, interest free spending for a year or balance transfers for a yeah. year. That's that's I think that's more typical here maybe than over there. But it feels a lot less shoved down your throat. As in like when you when you start getting a new credit card in the states, they'll offer you every single best possibility, like three percent over here. But I remember when I like when I when I right now how many how many cards how many banks I use? I use probably like two or three banks in London. There's not a single one that shoved this thing where it's like, get this credit card, you'll get three percent off of every single spending that you. I mean, at least it's, Amex probably do. Uh, well, it's probably because it's America. <laughs> probably because it's America at that point. So I think that's probably one of the biggest difference is that uh, the culture over there is like, they they definitely shove all this kind of stuff with you. As opposed to right now, it's it's on the lighter side in the Europe's, I guess. But do you, I feel like it's gonna come at some point? Do you feel like it's gonna be a viable business model? Because obviously, the whole point of having these awards is so that people get more. Uh, Use and debt on these credit cards, and hopefully they don't pay it, and that's how they probably generate money. I guess I don't know. I'm pretty sure that was a, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was the whole concept of having these credit cards with crazy benefits. I so would that, assume that the bank makes some money on processing as well. So if the bank handles their own payment processing, which I think maybe I'm just just really guessing here for larger banks might yeah. be true. So just by you spending money. They they get you know like more money going on the card and they probably get some sort of processing fee or yeah I don't know somewhere from the card owner somehow owner. yeah there, there must be something in there. There's definitely a different approach. To be I think fair, it's, it's it's a quite interesting topic of what will happen with all, all the banking with at least in the UK with all these challenger banks. Back to the point back to the point of Monzo. I mean I guess it's smart that they. They don't aid those use cases that we used it for, right? We just, I was very convenient to top it up with some money with like Apple Pay. And yeah. then I just went abroad and took shitload of cash out. And essentially I used it as a money transfer tool. I yeah. mean, that's not good for Mozart. It costs them a lot. What they want is they probably, they don't even mind having a little less users as long as those, those users paying in their salaries and starting to use it as a proper bank and replacing their, their other banks and not just using it as a, basically as a travel card that gives them better conversion rates. And probably those not those are not the valuable users for them. Yeah. So it makes sense. Now it's the interesting time back on the credit card uh, discussion of how do these uh, kind of startup banks or challenger banks are actually going to monetize their services because they have a lot of customers now and yeah they have like overdraft and they start selling credit products but that's just mean that just means that they become a bank right like they're going to yeah. do the same as a bank they're just going to have a better app. Exactly. Well, That's great, but I mean, Monzo's promises, I think, if I'm correct, is that they're gonna tell you when to switch electricity providers and oh yeah, then they do like, like they, they're gonna or something. yeah. Like. So basically, they they also look at you as a bit of data. So they try to understand. A bit. <laughs> they try to understand how you spend money, what you spend money yeah, on, and, the and give habit. you offers, give you better offers. Again, it's like ads. I mean, getting a personalized ad is better than a non-personalized ad. Getting like offers based on my behavior is better than getting random offers from my bank. So that makes sense. But then again, they're going to sit on like some incredibly kind of private data, right? Yeah, I definitely so how don't... far they go monetizing it is, is, well, yeah, is exactly. interesting. Yeah, exactly. Because I definitely do remember that feature that there was like, oh yeah, um, let us uh, manage your budget kind of thing. Monzo came out with this feature where it's just like, uh, just let us know how you spend your kind of stuff. That that was definitely shoved down with it. I remember that thing was quite prominent in terms of I don't personally use it because for some reason I think there's better options out there and I can manage. But it was something that I feel like they put a lot of importance on. And I don't know if it's doing good or not. That's probably something that uh, I'd I'm love really to research. I'm really a good Monzo customer. Every now and then I go into the labs and, and switch on some like new UI or new feature just to see it. But I'm, I'm actually one of those customers. They probably don't like that much. I, I mean, Wait, so I you use, it as a, you I use, use a travel card. More. I, I use the travel card. When I travel, I put money on it yeah. and I spend it from Monzo. But when I'm in the UK, I just use my credit card to be honest. I don't even know why. It, it, I mean, I mean, it, it's because it, it, Monzo gives me more details around where I spend my money, but I, I don't care that much for that, I'm, that I'm, information. I'm with, you. I'm with you on that. And also, I guess if I spend more from my credit card, it gives me a better credit rating somehow. And yes. then when I eventually go get a mortgage, which I really should do at some point, then, then, then that probably is so going to be helpful. I, I love talking, well, not that I love talking, I happen to talk about this quite often, is that, like, somebody told me that um, it's not good to use your credit card for every menial tiny thing. Even though you pay back every month, you, like, going to groceries, buying, like, two pounds of stuff, credit card, credit card, credit card, even though you pay it every time, somebody said that it wasn't good for your credit score. I disagree with that. I disagree with the fact that um, if you end up 
like paying everything on time and everything. That has to be good for your credit score, if you know what I mean. It should be. I mean, it, I guess it's even better for your credit score if you don't pay on time and you start to pay interest, but yeah. you pay the minimum all the time. I mean, what the bank is looking for is that, you know, even if you get into a debt type of situation, then you pay on time. I mean, that's the best thing, right? That they know exactly. that you're you're good for the money. I mean, if you if you don't actually use it and don't actually take credit, like you don't actually like take credit and pay interest, then yeah, that's good. But they much more like, I guess, a, a good interest paying customer. So if you have a lots of like lots of loans and you always pay them on time, that, that means that, well, we could sell you more. Exactly, because you're you're kind of reliable on that point. I think I, I think that specific debating point was at like the frequency of it. So is it better to have somebody who just buys big purchases? Even though I don't like think so. both cases you end up paying right on time. It's just one person. I don't less think frequent there's much one. difference. I think I think for me it's just like it probably doesn't I, I, matter. I, I wouldn't if you repay it on time, I think that's probably the biggest res- like responsible thing you could do to begin with this is a quite a complicated industry we know very little about so i the credit score like generally like banking i think is just you know definitely not where Um, i'm very knowledgeable so we're just like talking about the user experience side of things really that's the thing so there's a lot of stuff that you see from the user experience like uh what especially how nowadays it's a lot more accessible like i never actually had a banking app on my phone until monzo came in so you know how hsbc sometimes they'll push it uh lloyd's push it sometimes i think like all the barclays are pushing like Get the mobile app. Get the mobile app. For some reason, I've Weird. never been with it. If you know what I mean, like I've never been with the fact that I'm with could... Barclays. I use their app from like since I got the card really, or since I got a smartphone. Okay. Uh, I mean, it wasn't exactly the fastest app. It wasn't the, exactly the best app. But they had a couple of good things. Like Pingit came out like ages ago, and you could just send people money by their phone numbers. Mind you, you had to be another Barclays customer to to do that. But uh, yeah. they had they had some relatively you know usable. And like customer and customer facing features, and they've been putting some money behind the app. I've been receiving emails from Barclays that they're redoing their app, and surprisingly, redoing their app didn't mean that they put like a cooler branding on it, and especially with like damaging the user experience, because that's what those companies used to do. They actually kept the UI as it used to be, like keeping it familiar, but made it a lot faster. So it kind of like it makes you think that all these challenger banks are are finally awakening the banks that. They are waking they, them up that they actually need to care about the the customer experience, the technology side of the customer experience, and I mean, you and I can only benefit from that. That the big banks are getting a bit more competitive than Compa- trying competition to. Competition is good. Yeah, that's just like that's good for us. Like I, I mean, love it. I was uh, I was gonna say. I mean, right right when you were talking about competition or whatever, I think the biggest. I mean, the most recent news for I think more the gamer crowd out there is that you know AMD mm-hmm. uh, versus Intel. So both of them manufacture uh, CPUs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And recently, I don't know if it's 100% confirmed or not, but uh, there's always a benchmark that they do. Every time a new chip comes out, they call it the Geekbench. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, recently, AMD just topped Intel. After, what, 18 years of Intel being on top, AMD recently. King yeah. king of the block now. New kid on block, kill it. So that's when you're seeing competition. King, king on the block, but like, you know, remember when, you know, it was cool to have like an Intel inside sticker on your laptop? Yeah. When was the last time you saw that? Come on. I mean, like you don't even use a laptop. Like, yeah, to be honest, like, a laptop. <laughs> like, do you don't, do you even know what processor is in yeah. your smartphone? You probably do. And, you know, I might have an idea as well. I'm not to be, not to be honest, I'm not perfectly sure, but I mean, Intel and AMD seriously missed the trick there, right? Well, that, that's a hundred percent that. But, uh, also the other point that I'd like, I kind of see nowadays is that like when you're talking about direct competition, the one benefit is you could definitely see that for the same caliber of CPUs available from both ends they're both at a much reasonable price. If there's competition, because back then, like Intel always used to be like the top gun. It was always more expensive and you could see these like money versus value kind of thing. They would never have a good score because they're not worth always the money. Maybe. But they've definitely adjusted it because when you have like somebody just topping you and like you can maintain that high standard of all yeah, the product. Yeah, no, price, so. um, yeah, true. And I mean, banks been like the big high street banks been incredibly comfortable for a very long time. You know, like you could choose between them, but realistically that wasn't all yeah. that much of a difference and now there's a couple of you know new boys in town the monzos the starlings the you know revoluts the you know there's and, plenty and of them and even apple getting into banking now with the apple card in the, the new US, card. It's, yeah it's I've quite interesting that. that's quite hard for like monzo i guess monzo's key play is to get into the us now that sounds really good as long as you don't compete with apple i guess yeah. well i, I mean no i mean the thing is i think it overlaps i think at some point everybody's gonna overlap like apple is what competing with everybody on nearly everything not everything everything but like when you talk about like major headline news there's gonna be some sort of competition out there for apple and everybody but um the one thing that i wanted to point out was that if we look at the time frames 
you got all these banks that have been here for like 100 years. You know what I mean? Like they've been here for, a, like they have a legacy behind them. You have all these, um, I think Lloyd's has been here since like what, 18 something? I think they say something like that. And then you have like, when you're talking about new kids on the block, Monzo started in our lifetime. Yeah. It, it's weird to think about it. Is that I mean, like... Come on, Monzo gives you current accounts. Like if you, I, I don't really understand it either, but if you, if you knew the amount of things that a big high street bank does with like, investment or i don't know yeah. like issuing bonds or 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 i don't know raising funds for like a steel factory or whatever somewhere around the world like the, the business side of things that we know very little about yeah. like the big business side of things then probably there's a fair bit more money in there than your actual like managing your current account and i'm sure that will be eventually disrupted by some technology as well but i don't even understand those things so Can, yeah that's actually uh something that i, that I want to build upon because i uh, you mentioned revolut they came out, the, I think their latest feature is that they started allowing these uh, stock trading on it. So yeah, one other I mean, aspect. I, I mean, Revolut just does like everything, right? You can buy Bitcoin, trade stock. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't get it. I think it's like every now and then I hear about this and it sounds like a bit of a feature creep to me is that it does, does but do many time, things. Like I'd rather they focused on one thing uh, than, But at the know, same time, so many, if, you, if you look at the... Like main high street bank kind of thing. HSBC has a big like investment division as well. They'll have a whole like more than a big department just yeah. doing all kind of investment. So if they're basing their model off of that, why would that be crazy? They're, still, they're just no, doing it still, much let's faster. Still, let's and still much. end user trading or like customer trading of shares. It's not a huge volume. What I meant with the, with the big banks, they probably do a lot of like uh, I don't like know, contract currency trading exactly, yeah. and like like big company investments, acquisitions, mergers, whatever, loans, debt financing of like huge companies or whatever. I'm sure there's a lot of these like big business to business transactions that make them uh, loads of money. I don't know, 5% interest on on financing hundreds of millions or billions to a large company probably makes more money than running current accounts for half the UK. Yeah. And and the thing I, is, I, I really wouldn't know. I think I I can't really tell you much more about. I mean, like, like I'm, really I'm clearly it. not an expert at this either. But it's just that you just got to think about the logical sense of you know what's kind of happening is that, um, I mean, significantly they're not as big when you talk about the challenge. Like even the term challenger bank, they're just not as significant in the game to begin with. But they're big enough to be you know a like a pecking threat. If you know what I mean, like it starts pecking at their market share and all that. Because one one of the things that um, well, I I guess so. But I think if for example Monzo wants to do like. A credit card or wants to issue loans they're probably going to go to a third party company who actually issues the loan and the interest rate yeah. and does the due diligence and Monzo then manages the the actual end user experience i would presume that's how it happens yeah. and then they might actually go to the bank and i think probably still more money made on that side than the actual user experience side but then again i, I really don't know much about this so As, what, yeah, what, what i really want to avoid is, is you know do like an alan sugar i think when he did uh, say that the ipod is crap and it's never going to happen and nobody's yeah. going to ever use it did they so refresh like, it this year or something <laughs> yeah i mean it, it it was pretty successful for a for a prolonged time so you know us predicting the future and analyzing these big industries without being experts is always i always want to tread like tread very carefully with that cuz and these are opinions and a lot of like very smart people have been proven badly wrong on these these predictions so i you know I, yeah you never know i just, I just... it's a crazy thing about these predictions that like youtube is big on it as in people that would just put predictions on it and the thing is you could have a thousand people wrong and that one person right and that one person gonna be like i got it right you know what i mean like if you have a thousand people guessing and you have one of them that happens to be right on it somebody was right at the end of the day so i i'm, I'm kind of on the on the, on the aspect is that like i like people speculating and guessing these kind of stuff because there's some thought and truth and process behind it, if you know what I mean. If nobody did it, then we nobody would ever have any thoughts being shared at the end of the day. So it's quite nice. I mean, if in these financial services, there's there's plenty of different ones. Like you have like apps to get by the day car insurance. There's app to invest your money into stocks. There's apps to have like actually bad, like better um, current accounts. There's you know, without naming all that many companies. Like there's like yeah, there's uh, mortgage companies or comparison companies yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's just like loads of these startups that are replacing smaller parts one by one chip away at these the, the large portfolio of services that 
traditional financial institutions used to provide for They're you, just, which yeah. is, is, is kind of fun, but it's it's basically, it's like a lot of specialist services doing those little jobs for you. And I'm pretty sure that eventually we'll see some consolidation here as well. And, you know, all those small players are going to end up in groups and do these yeah. things together. It's a cycle. So yeah. like they're starting breaking everything down and then they're just going to build everything back up. Yeah. A lot of it is uh, when we're talking about these uh, middlemen or these like third party service right in between that just like facilitates uh, the flow to one another. I think the best example is that um, when there's a gunfight, you want to be the one selling the guns. Well, you know, what? like it's kind of it's I kind of concept. Where it's I, like, don't, I don't know. Well, it's, I just like. I mean, to be fair, though, I guess the analogy. It was it so was, it was more a metaphor. Yeah. yeah, it was. I didn't actually mean the actual thing, but I'm talking about like <laughs> if you take any, um, for example, like any competition going on. Like one thing that's really big esports at the moment. Yeah. Obviously, you have people backing on each side, and you want like players competing or whatever. But the people running these tournaments, they're the one that's making the big money. When you think about the people that are running uh, a business, so you have like okay, Showtime, which is one of the biggest, um, yep. you know, uh, for boxing in the boxing world, the biggest mm -hmm. uh, streaming service or anything, just putting the media out there. Um, you have like what they love doing is that they'll take um, they'll they'll take one of the more lesser transparent aspect of boxing. So, for example, Floyd Mayweather, how much money does he make? Or uh, when Conor McGregor comes in and like fight Floyd Mayweather, what's the business behind it? They're more than happy with these people having their numbers putting out there. Floyd Mayweather made like what 120 million this fight kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, 120 million, how much is Showtime making off of this? Like, they're more than happy to disclose all like you know, I guess what they want to put in front of the media. But the people running the business, they're making bank. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Like typically, yeah, the, you know, being famous is is good if you're you know aligned that way. But you know, being a football player is probably great, and some of them make exceptional mon exceptional money, but Probably the owners of the football clubs are yeah. usually richer than them. Like that's just that's just normal, right? Yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's probably it's, the same in esports as well. Yeah, that's the thing. So, like, I think I think it's just uh, when uh, when just really back to all these like tiny services that you're talking about. Like, there, um, you have these people that are just like breaking down all these tiny services because they see the need to not the need. They see the appeal of uh, being able to create an eco ecosystem and having the users like you know using it, and then they're basically the one. I just so, learned. I think the. Like I don't know if I've just heard about the the story of how Transferwise was Transferwise was founded. Uh, there was a guy in Estonia and a guy in London. The two founders I don't, I don't remember their names. I'm sorry. But That's fine. Basically, yeah. one of them lived in Estonia, needed to pay something monthly in London, and the other one lived in London and needed to pay something in Estonia monthly. And they were both transferred money, and they realized that they pay a fair bit to the banks. And then yeah. they just said, like, what well, if you pay mine and I'll pay yours? And that was the idea. It wasn't like anything rocket science. They just didn't understand why they're paying so much for the banks. And why they did pay so much for the banks is because the banks could get away with it because exactly. everybody used to. And then somebody challenged it and they did. I don't think there's people who, who, who go in there and they want to chip away at like something. I think they yeah, have. Exactly. They, 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 they see that a specific service of a company or a product could be done much better. And they, they try doing that. It's, I think, it's I think great. yeah, the lesson here is question it. I think the, the lesson here is that question whatever, whatever happens, whatever you do at this point. Because you could take anybody's like, you know, uh, the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed kind of thing. You could just sometimes, if you have the time to do the exercise, sit down and think about it. Think about what oh. you do in between... Can we can we can we just break down what what a day in in balanced life look like at the moment? I don't know. What, just on this previous topic, though, I, what I really admire in these startup founders is the, and these innovators is persistence. So I think you know you don't you know it's it's good to have great ideas. It's good to have amazing execution. But I think average or above average ideas with with you know like incredible amount of persistence and vision and driving towards that vision that probably not a lot of people around you believe in will eventually yield results like a lot of people looked at I don't know even Steve Jobs was looked at as a crazy person at some point pushing those Mac initiatives back in the day when Apple was failing and then yeah. eventually he did it at next and whatever and came back and you know actually made a fair bit of success with his kind of uh, vision that doesn't have or that, that like doesn't allow for any compromise whatsoever. Now it's a brutal process because he wasn't the nicest person with many people around him. Yeah. But his vision was incredibly good, and he was incredibly persistent delivering it. Like nobody could tell him otherwise, and he was right. If if people are that persistent and believe that strongly in their vision, then it, it's it's and, and and especially I think one key element is that you you're able to organize smart, talented people around you and you're able to spot them and rally them, then it's just going to happen. Like, I don't think Elon Musk, for example, is the best rocket scientist or uh, battery manufacturing person in the world. He just has these, like, 
like really strong visions that he can sell to incredibly smart people and he takes no compromises and then he gathers these incredibly smart people around him and they together they make it happen obviously a couple of people will burn out in the process but yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's that that vision and persistence is something i really admire in 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 these innovators i don't know if i explain myself all that well with my you know moderate english and hungarian like, no but i mean english skills but i think that's 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 an incredible attribute of a of of, of a founder yeah. or an innovator of a founder yeah and the thing is like when you when you describe somebody like that they don't really have a job title like you know what i mean like you can't just be like every single ceo is like that or every single founder is like that or every single executive is like that it's just you know the person more as their name more than their actual role if you know what i mean yeah I mean, just I, because they yeah. set like when you like i'm really really glad they put in point of that that like they sell an idea they know they know that it requires a team to do it they know that if they do it individually it might just not happen it's just that i mean being, to me to me both steve jobs or or, or Elon Musk, if you had to choose, I'd probably say that they are product guys. And this sounds really crappy for me because no, I no, do no, product no. You as have well. A point. You have a point. But I, I, I think that's that's really their skill of, of actually seeing what product will work where and developing that product. They're probably not like necessarily sales guys, probably very charismatic though. But they're, they're definitely people. not finance people. I mean... But they're people people or person people or whatever you want to call it. As in like, for example, when um, I... There's a really great book. For some reason I was reading it. It's called Founders at Work. And uh, Steve Wozniak was on it. And Steve Wozniak, everybody calls him the Wad, the wizard. You know, yeah, the Wad. The, the absolutely the, the, the genius behind it. He wasn't great at... Um, well, I don't know. I don't know if it's true. I don't remember exactly what it was that like. He was definitely more the hardware guy, you know, just building insanely um yeah. you know for for his time the logic boards were absolutely at next level but you, when, you know that he i think the apple one once he created it i think if i remember well uh, he, yeah he was working at hp at the time and he took it into the hp office and told his bosses that hey i made this and i'm working at hp like i think you can have it if you want to and then they told him like that's all very nice but we don't think that every single person yeah. in the world will need a computer at home one day so yeah you can keep your hobby and, and then, and then, like it's know, like you keep a hobby. Then what do you but, want to do about it? But what do you most didn't see the 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 actual potential value of this yeah, either. I, gonna... I think it's just it's just you know that he had a friend who actually was who seen the bigger picture so and the longer term, right? That's exactly where that came in. So in the in the in his actual interview of that found his work kind of thing. So he didn't mention that while he was working on the Apple One, that's when he was also working at HP. And he definitely said himself that he was happy to retire at HP. He was happy to spend his whole life yeah. doing it. But it was kind of this Steve Jobs factor that came in that. I think the official one that they sold, like the first Apple, I saw is the Apple II, technically, because yeah. the Apple I never actually made it to whatever production. And what Steve was saying about, um, sorry, Steve Wozniak was saying about Steve Jobs was that um, he was the one being able to make these connections, like talking to the right people, even getting the first round of investment. Back then, back then, we're talking about investments, like he, he, Steve Jobs convinced somebody to give them what, like 50 grand to work on this project or whatever. Back then it was like a lot of money, you know what I mean? Back then it was like significant enough for what? Both of them to not work a year and just completely do this. So when you're talking about recognizing us, you know, recognizing what needs to be done and who's good at what. So I think Steve Jobs from his point of view was that he recognized that the yeah. walls was really good at building all these circuitry boards, connecting uh, connecting everything together and producing like an actual hardware. Yeah, but but I, in, think, I actually think there's a lot more people out there who can who can build it really well. Like the boss. Uh, yeah, There's on the a lot same more level. of those type of people out there, and I think a, a, a little less of the, you know, the like, we always do this Apple analogy, but anyway, the jobs type of people who, yeah. who who can spot this kind of future event that they really believe in going to happen and, and, and actually thing. drive towards it. So, and also, I think that's that's what I mean as well. That like these these people need to gather incredibly smart people around them, the Johnny Ivies or the the. The voices, the you know, they really need to be able to spot the talent and yeah. and really motivate and, and excite the talent around them. And right? the, and the thing is, like you, um, by the time you notice them, it's not, they've been doing it for they've they've reached a point. By the time you notice them, is that what you want to give credit is the people nowadays, today, right now, just anybody that you work with or like you just know that are kind of in the same pathway. Like I feel like they need to be pointed out whenever when you see somebody who can take that pathway. I think it's more like you gotta you gotta share because I mean like what most of these stories they just start in somebody's like oh like kitchen and then they just manage to produce something and the fact that it is happening today it, like i i'm pretty sure it is happening all around that you have this kind of ideas going about but it's just being able to recognize it and just yeah but ideas don't worth a lot right i mean i think ideas i think actually persistence right like i mean how many ideas have you had in the last year of what startups you want to set up and you know and how many, many do we, <laughs> we all have and yeah like 
It's executed. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's an interesting part as well when you when you hire for a product person, like, yeah. for example, it's good to look for like bias towards action. I learned that from a very smart person uh, and, and it, it makes absolutely perfect sense. So like, you actually want to find people who, when they have an idea there, rather than just sharing it and writing like a memo about it, they yeah. go and actually start executing it. Yeah, I think like, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people, um, well, not a lot of people, what I think is that the hardest point is zero to one. And then everything after that is probably like less hard than zero to one. And then it's like, it's kind of like an exponential thing where, for example, YouTubers will be like, my hardest audience was probably from zero to a thousand or zero to a hundred is probably the biggest audience, the hardest bit. And then when it slowly gets there, zero to a thousand, a uh, hundred to a thousand, then a thousand to ten thousand kind of thing, kind of snowball. So it's kind of the same idea where it's like execution on the first steps. Like if you do put yourself out there, then that's definitely a lot harder than, you know, uh, working on top of a product that exists already. Yeah. But the other thing that I did want to point out was that uh, when we were talking about these, all these great figures, you would say like, you know, uh, Bill Gates, um, Peter Thiel, uh, Larry Page, all these kind of people, and then Steve Jobs, all that kind of stuff. They didn't, it, like, they didn't succeed every single time. Like, Steve Jobs, for example, there was a point where Apple was basically bankrupt. They were basically, like, in the middle of, you know, the biggest crisis of not being able to survive. And yeah. then you have people lending hand in there and then yeah. just pulling that out. Yeah, because he, he was, uh, but Jobs was still kind of pretty convinced about his vision. And it's, I think, you know, like, the same with Elon Musk as well. He spent, I've just read his biography. That's probably, I'm talking yeah. about him a little bit too much, but he, he, he almost burned all his cash at some point as well. But it's kind of, if you struggle through it and you still risk it, it probably eventually, your chances of, of, of making it are probably bigger. But then again, I always find this very weird. You know, we talk about these podcasts and, you know, like everybody out there talks about these guys and dish out all sorts of opinions whilst we, we haven't started any companies ourselves, so it's, well, yeah. it's it's quite funny how we're so strongly opinionated on these people and how they were great or terrible or you know how I could do better. But really, there were the sad reality is that we don't even try. So yeah, I mean, I, I thought that's that's what baffles me as well. Of what that's what's what's that trigger that uh, makes a person try? Because we always say like, yeah, if I had the financial security and whatnot, these people didn't, or even when they did, they still risked it. So it's it's that's the that's the thing that's that's that's, that's not, also quite an amazing quality, yeah, I guess. Not everybody's ready to, to you know open a restaurant, for example. You know, opening a restaurant with uh, the whole fees of just having the space and getting the new equipment in, it's a big deal. It's a big deal that you start from the negative right when you open a restaurant. I think that's yeah. unless unless obviously you have the means to do it. But I think most of the time when somebody opens a restaurant, it's you're always in the negative, and not everybody's willing to do it. Not everybody has it in them to be. I'm going to risk everything and just put it... Well, I mean, you, know, you don't have to start in, like, opening your first restaurant in Oxford Circus or, I don't know, wherever yeah. the rent is the highest. You can probably start, like, relatively easy, like, local and whatnot. I'm pretty sure you can... I, I, I don't know how you build a restaurant anyway, but I'm that's actually sure Yeah, you, that's you, another, you know, different, you, different you, thing. You, you can time. be smart about it, but that's not something I ever thought of. Yeah, but I think but if anyway, you look well, at the... If you look at the bigger picture, though, it's kind of the same thing as a pitch, though, because they definitely had to make a pitch to somebody to get them the money to do it. Probably. So it was kind of the same idea as that, like, if ever you, I mean, you have a, you have a product that is, I mean, still in an infancy, you know what I mean? Like, it's something that you have a bit of traffic or whatever, and you have to pitch it. Is that not the kind of same idea of opening a restaurant? You've got a product, you know how to make these kind of food, you know how to envision all that, but then you just have to pitch it. And then well, it's by that of... measure, almost everything is, but I, I think it's quite different selling, like, pasta and selling, like, you know, an app. Yeah, like, so I guess it, 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 it has some similarities in there, but I, I, I would assume it's quite different skills at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, it is quite different, but if you categorize about stuff, is that like they're kind of, it's a big investment. If we talk about it, is that like it's a career move that is, is an investment? I suppose, like, when you, my biggest opposite counter to that is that when you people do like a job, an hourly paid job or like a yearly paid job, is that, is that, a complete category, different category, because like you're not really building anything. You're part of a project, yeah, but you're hired by the project to do that kind of stuff. As opposed to when you have somebody who owns their own restaurant, everything lays on them. They probably, they well, probably. I yeah, mean, I guess there's no such thing as share options in a restaurant, right? If you're yeah. a waiter, I don't think so. I guess in, I mean, that's my personal view on it. Is that I always talk about startups, but I, I never really have the guts to kind of do my own, I, or at least I never had so far. I mean, you know, oh, you still got ne- plenty of time. Yeah, I never might, seen everyone that. might eventually roll my sleeves up, but I always went relatively comfortable. Typically, like after Series A or sometime when a company actually has money, that's when I join. And then, you know, I get the comfort of a reasonable salary, but I get a bit of exposure to like share options. Hopefully that's actually going to make me something one day. And then, but I'm so still early enough to have the job 
pretty exciting. So it's like a, a reasonable middle ground for me, and there's probably nothing wrong with that. Oh, also, there's definitely nothing wrong with that. Also, with like product, it's typically hard because the founders and, or the founder, the CEO, should probably have a strong product vision. And the, the, the only time they should start giving that up is when they, their, their time is not enough to own that and when the business has grown enough that they need somebody to, to manage that for them. And, you know, then typically then it's, it's, you know, it's when you had like a round of fundraising and you're growing and that's, and that, that works out for me so far. But I'm hoping that one day I will try as well, but I, I, I might yeah. not. You never know. I, it's such it's such a good way to see it because um because obviously when we talk about like time how much time do I have to do this how much time do I have to do that how do you how do you um how do you manage that if you have an idea how much time you want to put into it do you do you drop everything so if somebody has a crazy good vision I'm gonna be convinced is the procedure to be like I'm gonna just quit everything and just go into it or no, do you I mean, want to do half and half or do you want to do like I'm gonna work on this every time I'm not at work I mean if you have a good idea you should not stop working if you have a good idea. You should probably use your evening and whatever to create a prototype, create a mock-up, like write down how it's going to work, create like a three-page business model and ask your friends if it still makes sense, ask for opinions and maybe if you get like good feedback on it, you probably don't need to sign NDAs with your friends. Yeah. Uh, uh, hope, I mean, hope, uh, uh, <laughs> I would hope so. The Facebook but, but, founders and the yeah, Bing, what was yeah. the Winkle Boss? Like, I think it Winkle worked out for everyone in the, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. I think everybody got enough money to get that's by on that one. So, but keep uh, on going with. Uh, but anyway, get some idea, get some early validation. Like, you'd be stupid for le- to, to to leave like a good job for an idea. Like, you know, spend a couple of weeks or months on trying to define it a little bit better, think about it, sleep on it, ask some smart people you know and you trust for opinions and introductions to people who could actually help you launch it. And when you see that there might be somebody who would buy it from you if it was actually a real thing or somebody might even throw money at you, I mean, that's the time you quit your job. But even then, you don't have to be radical. You can probably do part-time first. I mean, yeah, if your idea is amazing and after you're just creating the prototype or writing down the, the business plan, everybody's throwing money at you and want to buy it, then yeah, then quit in that immediate second. But I don't think it's it's necessarily like that. G- given Give the example of TransferWise. These two guys realize that if they pay each other's bill locally, it's going to be better. And I think they set up some sort of website where you could register and say, hey, I, yeah. I need to pay something here and I'm living here. And they just exchanged people so that they can do their private arrangements. It's a long time since it's extended into what it is now. Like, I don't know how many, like, thousand, like, over a thousand people they employ, I think, or they're, like, huge. Yeah. It takes a long time. You're, like, you know, that's probably not not where you start. Exactly. And and you pointed out the fact that, like, their intent was not, we're going to make so much money out of this. We're like, no, their, their intent was that, no, we're going to make it more convenient for us to begin with. But then if it benefits the people around us, we'll do it. And, um, what, the side effect is, you know, getting a bit of money out of it. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with, you know, making you and your surroundings slightly better and then, like, profiting off of it. So, um... Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the founders mean that. I'm not sure about VCs, but hey. Yeah, VCs are a different thing. How do you even get a job as a VC? Do you just pull your heart out of your chest and just be like, I'm no, going to be a like VC. management I'm consultant gonna... type of like person, yeah. I think. I heard a lot of, uh, yeah. a lot of positions as uh, being analysts first. I think being an analyst yeah. first and then you slowly get into yeah. a VC bit. But um, I mean, the ab- ability to, to analyze like with strong structures of how a business is doing, what stage they are and what their potential is. Yeah. It's quite an abstract science. If you're any good in that, then probably uh, you're valuable for a, v- for a VC. Well, that's the thing. I would assume so. Oh, man. If I ever, if I ever do know more about it, I'm definitely going to have you back in the know. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about like how VC works. Um, the other thing was that like, I really did enjoy the bit where you were just saying um, uh, how you share your time between a side project and like the thing because I mean, for the ones that didn't know, Balan, uh, what do you cur- currently do? You're a... Uh, I'm working in product at a startup. Yeah, they just have like a title. Yeah, yeah. title. Head of product is so, the title. Yeah, Ooh. so basically what we're doing is that like, you, do have a bit, like, you do have a, a very good understanding on how these kind of, I mean, project, obviously, these product works at the end. And what I want to relate to is that I do know a couple of people who are kind of in a situation where they'll have ideas and they'll try to uh, take their time to do it. And I've I've seen some people bootstrap it. And by bootstrapping, I mean no loans or anything. You just start from zero. You just invest whatever you can into it. And then uh, you don't owe money to anybody. Uh, you just work on that. Well, that's nice. But A, that requires you to have money, right? I yeah. mean, you can max out your credit card and whatnot. That's extreme. And a lot of people did that. And, you know, if it works for you, it's great. And if not, then, you know, you probably have to ask your mom to remortgage her house. Uh, let's, uh, hey, let's hope but, let's not get to but, that. But, <laughs> like, but, but I, I guess the question of whether you raise money is not always the fact that that whether you could bankroll the business. I mean, let's say you have, I don't know, 
uh, 50k in the bank yeah and your business is growing slowly and you might even like you know make a profit or you break even but what if somebody gave you like you know two million to grow faster could you do faster than well, that's earning the more cash and i mean if you can then probably you should and, and you so, should just just spend it just, <laughs> just like well, it's, it's, maybe like, they can be smarter yeah. about it but, but yeah i mean that's i i do like that because there's obviously like a grade to it so um like one of one of the things that I've been witnessing is that a friend of mine is doing a business at the moment, and I don't know how much he invested, but it's nowhere near the remortgaging a house kind of thing. It was more like a side thing that just happened. You like in terms of buying the actual product, like the the hardware behind, like all the actual tools, maybe like we'll really like maybe like a grand or something. So like it's very minimal if you think about it. But like for an individual doing that, spending a grand on something is already a big commitment. Well, I guess it depends. It's also very interesting, I think, if you look one, one level deeper into this, that very few people set out to create a successful, profitable company. Most people set out on creating the next WhatsApp that they built for like five years with 10 people and then flogged for like, what, 16 billion? Yeah. So nobody actually wants to create a sustain. Well, not nobody, I, I would not say that. But few There's all kind of people out there. Few, <laughs> right. few people want to create a sustainable, like long-running business that gives tens of thousands of people of jobs everybody wants to create a startup that then i don't know one of those big companies acquire for a couple of hundred millions and then yeah. you know the, the actual goal is not to create a business that's successful and self-sustained but to create a business that i can sell for you more than it's out. worth yeah you could just yeah, cash out which, I is, think. which is okay but i guess you know if 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 we're going by the latter so if we're going that that's your goal then you should definitely entertain investment because if that means you can grow the business burning more cash you can grow the business quicker and show it its future value quicker so you can let somebody buy it quicker and then it's their problem not yours yeah uh, and the thing is like is there is there something wrong with that what is there is it is a good or bad thing well i don't know it's an interesting one right like creating hugely unprofitable businesses at at, at very large scale that well, have a lot of <laughs> shout users, out to we work so... shout out to uber shout out to slack kind of burning all these money kind of thing i don't know if all of those are non-profitable but maybe uh, as far as i know like last time i checked i think they're all yeah. non-profitable but i mean they built up this enormous user base but some of them i think have the potential to become a uh, probably most of those become uh, they have the potential to become a, a self-sustained profitable company like if you paint this amazing vision for uber that they're going to be the actual logistics company that sends a self-driving car for you and take you somewhere that does all the all the road transportation for lorries and whatnot and all the deliveries of anything whether that's food or your groceries and they just have this like enormous network of smart intelligent self-driving cars if you think about that vision then surely that's going to be worth a profitable company so they yeah. can still afford to burn cash. I mean, in some other examples, you, you struggle to see how having, I don't know, a couple of million people on a chat app or sharing their holiday images will actually be profitable. But, you know, the example says that that data is actually worth, you know, billions. Yeah. So, hey. Data ads, you know, all, all the kind of little bit. Um, yeah. I Yeah, that's... Uh, that's, I guess that's an end goal that a lot of people want to be. A lot of people want to be um, in the position where you could, uh, I mean, even be going into an IPO to begin with. Like even, you know, WeWork is planning on doing it. And then, you know, all these other people that recently IPO at Spotify, Slack, all them. I guess IPO is just a, well, I guess at that stage is just another like big fundraising round for the company and also a, a cash out round for all the, all the investors up so until that that's point, the... especially the like you know like the institu institutional investors probably yeah. look at that as a as a as an exit or more liquid liquid liquidity Liqu event. Ooh. So that's the thing. So it depends on what people envision. So some people at that point they'll I don't know if they give up. They just be like I'm done. Like the fact that you kind of you kind of got to that point, and be like oh I'm gonna cash out done next project. You know what I mean? Like that's the keep thing. On going that's, next. that's the real thing. Like I think it's so interesting. I had a previous job where you know the founder was working. That, you know like he already sold the business beforehand and this was his second business he already was you know i guess relatively wealthy on our on our our terms so had like a nice house somewhere in Hampstead or whatever and he was doing all right but he started a second startup he worked like 10 12 hours a day or i don't know on weekends and whatnot and was addicted to the work and yes eventually he made it to success as well but i think so what i mean by this is i think if your goal is to get rich quickly yeah 
then it's a lot more likely you're not going to succeed because you're short-sighted than if your goal is to build something that you're proud of and that grows and that, you know, I think if you, I, I don't know, I, this might sound very utopistic or very, no, no, like, well, like way too positive, but I think that, you know, generally if you have that vision of building a successful company, yeah. you probably, and your product vision and market vision and whatever, you're probably more likely to get there than if you just like, how can I make 20 million pounds in three years? So, I think. yeah. Um, okay, this is definitely my personal opinion. This is like just me talking about it. But my 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 stance on it is that uh, you have all these people that have um, multiple stages of cashing out. So you have Elon Musk who cashed out with PayPal once, and then he reused that money to fund all these different projects. I don't even the know company. if he wanted to cash out. Wasn't yeah. it? Wasn't well, I don't know if it was intentional. He just got acquired yeah. by eBay, and eBay like you know he got a really good share. I think it was like two hundred fifty million or whatever. I think he was but, out of PayPal beforehand, but anyway, like oh, but he's got a yeah. There, and his, then he used that to do it. Yeah. Um, my if you if you want to relate it to you and me or anybody like currently that are not in that position or whatever. These stages of cashing out at I mean, some point in your life. Elon Musk sold a startup before that for like many, many millions. Yeah, exactly. Like already a McLaren before he started like um, whatever was his company that merged with PayPal. So, so I think I think it's very different to do it when you already made one and very different exactly. when you're trying your first one. It's different if you're you know, already own your house and your car and you have like, okay. you know, your kids in like private school and whatnot, that, which I don't know if it's a good thing anyway, but but I guess then, then you know, <laughs> the risk taking school. appetite is, a, is yeah. probably a bit more, um, a bit higher. Yeah, I, yeah my, my, my whole, like this is my vision, my personal like opinion is that these concepts could, can be relatable. These concepts can be applied even though you don't own a company that could be sold for hundreds of million dollars. You... Like my goal, my goal as like just an individual in a society kind of thing is that you just want to have these phases. So for example, if currently you're like, I just want to be settled, I want to own my own house, for example, work on that project, cash out on the fact you're going to able to have a, so not like, you know, somewhere to, to, you own a piece of, you know, estate kind of thing. That, is, that doesn't require 250 million. That's a reasonable individual goal. So you start with that. And then that, like now that you got that kind of base secured, that's when you can keep on going yeah. with like the stuff. I mean, you should put stuff. like a timeline on it as well, because if your goal is to own a flat, then you know you're probably gonna end up with a thirty-year mortgage, and you know that's that's okay as well. But it's it's yeah. It's well, like I mean, there's the... different ways of going at it. Obviously, when you own a flat, there's I mean, if you fully own it, as in like if you're able to pay it off like before the thirty years, that's probably the I guess the phase I'm talking about is if you're able to generate some kind of wealth that secures all of that. So I mean, I, I, I guess what I mean with this this example that I, I I said is that if you're in it for the money, let's say you are you're you're founding Uber or Apple or. My Microsoft or you're yeah. founding one of these companies and you're the founder and like ask yourself if you know if if at like you know after like two three years somebody tells you hey here's 50 million would you give it up yeah and you know I think the people who founded these businesses they were like no way well that's I'm, the I mean, I'm not in it for the money I'm in it to make it a success and I don't know if it's true for every single one of these companies yeah. but you had to be addicted to your business idea you had to be like incredibly passionate about it to take to that level because you know, if, you, if if I founded a business and somebody would tell me like four weeks later that hey, here's a million for it, like even if I could make a lot more, I would be like, mm, yeah, okay. So amount of money. are you, yeah, are, are you on the side that like with these kind of projects? Because I have an example, I have a concrete example, of exactly these kind of cases. That imagine you're working on a project, or whatever, it's blowing up, but somebody's like, look, you you could be sorted. We'll give you four million or whatever it is. Your four million is gonna last you what, like seventy years, something like that. Are you going to cash out? My my current situation for me, yes. There's no there's no reason why I wouldn't do it. I guess that's why most most founders make their big money on probably on their second startup as well. Because yeah. if for a startup, you let's say okay, in that in that example, you sell for four million. Now you probably buy yourself a house for I don't know one one and a half. Buy yourself a car. And that's know, security. Like, that drive, you got your kids you know? in private school, but you got another two million or however many to yeah. left to invest. So you're going to say okay, so I'm going to start my next company. I can bankroll it up to like 20 people for like the next four years That's or thing. whatever. And then if that actually works, then you're not bound by any investors, what, 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 et cetera, but there's et cetera. Also the, you actually make your, yeah. your, your big payday. There's also a different aspect is that like, there's also people that cash out the formula to be like, I'm good. It's like they're going to have and the again, two million sitting there. Passive, again, I find passive it income. so hypocritical. I was talking about it and we never done it. You know, you should. But that's, these that's probably the you idea. Talk about with somebody who founded a couple. I mean, whether I they mean, failed or succeeded, I think they probably had more of an insight. We just, you know, we just. Well, that's it's, the it's thing. Just sounds, it's, I don't know. It just feels to me a bit it's sad just, that we all talk it's just about it. People this being book. aware of it. I think it, like if you're aware of it, that like everything you do can have these kind of like repercussion impact. It's better than nothing. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about these kind of stuff. The concrete example that I was mentioning before was. Uh, you know, Reddit, mm -hmm. it's worth, I don't even know how much it's worth nowadays, like billions or whatever. 
the founder, he's not with the company anymore, I don't think. Do you know how much mm-hmm. he sold his share for? Hmm? 10 mm-hmm. million. No. So that that's kind of like the example where you have a company who's probably... I'm pretty sure Red is more than a billion. He's probably definitely over a billion now. But if you look at in the picture that... Are you going to call him like dumb for cashing out at 10 million when the company is going to be worth... Uh, well, well, I mean, currently is worth over... I mean, a I guess we could because he didn't spot it the future opportunity, but I guess we can't because it's not like we have sold he, anything for more, yeah. right? Like he has 10 million. Is that rich. So, yeah. so the thing is, um, one of the points that I questioned, the first thing that I said was that, would the company have gone into this stage of worth, you know, over a billion or whatever it is, with him aboard on it? I don't know much about Reddit, so I yeah. can't I mean, yeah, you. to be fair, it's more like a hypothetical. Hypothet- so typically, you want to hold on to founders because they typically have, like, a good vision of yeah. where to take the company, but I'm pretty sure there are exceptions as well. Exactly. So, oh my god, this is kind of like the hypothetical that nobody really has an answer to, but mm-hmm. my, I, I want to defend the guy being like, if I was in his shoe, um, I probably would have done the same just because it was it was reasonable. It's 100 percent reasonable. He's he probably doesn't have to pay you like any any mortgage for the rest of his life. You know what I mean? He probably has to pay like land taxes. That's usually how it works. But other than that, if you have the opportunity to be you know financially free for security wise, like you know the Abraham bottom level of the pyramid, yeah. I would I would take that deal. If there was any deal out there that I've managed to secure myself, that I'll be you know the ba- the basics that is taken care Don't of. Don't get me wrong, I would be happy with it as well. But yeah. if 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 an opportunity ar- uh, uh, like came around to to you know make that decision of whether 10 million or take it further then you never know you try to evaluate the likelihood of you actually making more and if yeah. it's if it's large you you know like i guess from that level it's it's not you know if, when 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 you as a founder after i don't know a couple of fundraising can make 10 million those those companies are not that often failing. I think at that level, worst that can happen is you sell it for half as much. Okay. So if if you're, I guess you have to weigh up your outcomes. If you're, if you know, if it's fifty percent chance that you make twenty and fifty yeah. percent chance that you make five, and you know, then you know at that stage, I guess I would take the twenty because five is still enough. <laughs> yeah. <it's> like, yeah. <laughs> what's uh? What's your buyout number? What well, currently? If we're talking about today, I mean, what day I, is it? Twenty nineteen. I, I, What's I, your buyout number you know, today? I don't have a, a, a startup, so anybody giving me a salary, I'm happy with. That's what <laughs> yeah. my company does, right? So. Yeah. For me, my buyout number. I thought about this a lot. Is uh, my mama house, my dad house, and me house. That's basically it. That's my buyout number. If you get me all three of those, I'm more than happy to. But I mean, it's not realistic. I mean, all we've done is just sit down and talk about these kind of stuff this whole time. But. I think what I do want to want to try to do a lot is that I don't want to talk about ten million. I don't want to talk about one million. I want to talk about ten thousand. Ten thousand. If I if I manage to get a project ten thousand, I'll take a ten thousand. And then if I manage to get a project a hundred thousand, hundred thousand. You know what I mean? It's like it's not that I've it's not that you've never been in a position where you could I, I, I get projects. This, like, I don't think this should be money driven, right? Like oh yeah, to the, be fair though, that's the, probably the whole point that you're that, mentioning. That's, the that's whole the point. point. Yeah, I think that if you if you actually spot a gap in the market and you actually want to plug that gap or you yeah. want to do something different or you want to invent something that never happened before like an electric car or uh, or i don't know like whatever that that, that yeah. never worked before and that's your passion and that drives you you're so much more likely to make more money if your single goal is is money and you just yeah. you just want to make like a million or two or ten i i'm pretty sure it happens for some people but i think the way to create a successful company is to be passionate about the problem you're solving not yeah. the actual outcome of a payday so i think I think that's that's you know if you're if you're approaching it with that kind of view of that this is how much money I want out of it then well you're probably not the type of person who's going to make it the type of people who make it are the ones who do it for succeeding in solving that yeah. problem or seeing that vision and driven by that vision itself yeah and shout out to the people who actually uh, you know swim in those situations as opposed to like sinking and getting because I mean you would have people who have like crazy good ideas but somehow uh, just never never you know, never make out that. Either it's because some other people took advantage of it or uh, they never managed to, you know, find the, find the, I guess, the right... I guess ideas are cheap, right? Well, that's the thing. So it's, there's always two sides to every medal, but shout out to all the people who are actually trying to do that. Shout out to everybody who's actually like working on something that is menial. If you look at it, a lot of the stuff that came out of these crazy projects, they're very menial in terms of like, you kind of take it for granted that you do every single day, but you never really, you know, put the importance of sharing that, sharing that idea out there. So... Um, I I kind of want to see in terms of like, yeah, for for like for you guys individual, what what does a day look like? I think that's always something that I I'm interested in. What what kind of, as in like, uh, what kind of you know what does a what does a 
zero 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 to twenty three fifty nine look like in in the life of balance? That's I'm, probably. Uh, I mean, generally, I I'm not a big fan of sleeping. I feel like there's so much more I could do with life than sleeping. So that's so such for, a good answer. I don't, so, I don't know anybody so, else. So, so for that reason, I go to bed really late, and I you know I I just try to do more things in my day. But then the problem with me is that what I like even less than sleeping is waking up. So once I go to sleep, I'll try to postpone waking up as much as possible. So I'm, right. by the definition, I'm not like a morning person. I'm not the one who posts on LinkedIn about, I woke up on 4 a, at 4 a.m. and by the time I got to the office, I'd been to the gym, read three books, went to yoga. Guy. This guy's 6 a.m. every day. Shopping, <laughs> cook like three, like, I don't yeah. know what type of diet meals and what, I'm not that type of guy. Yeah. I, I wake up as late as possible, go to work, have a coffee, open my emails, have a mini heart attack, and then I, 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 I start working. And I, I don't know, I'll spend most of my time on, like, I don't know if fortunately or unfortunately, probably more the latter, unfortunately, in meetings, try to carve out some focus time, do my job, then come home. Uh, I don't know, pretty regular things, man. Go to the gym, stay with the girlfriend, I don't know, watch some telly, and uh, maybe do some shopping, cooking, whatever. I don't know. That's mm. so good. Nothing specific. Like, the week, weekends, I'm yeah. just hanging out with mates. Um, I don't know, try to switch off. And the thing Nothing is, like, too specific about me. It's it's good. It's good that you really just keep it real with the whole thing. And the thing is, like, you could take that kind of that kind of lifestyle and just compare it to a lot of other really successful people as well. And it's quite similar, if you know. Well, what I'm I mean. not really like, successful though. So that's, that's yeah. The thing. Um, well, I'm, I mean, we I'm, could also compare it to people who are really not successful. And you see some similarities, but it's just something that, like, you, um, if from a outsider point of view, looking at it, kind of thing, I think you're doing a lot of stuff that you're doing. Like, if you beat yourself so much about it. Then, well, I'm not beating myself. I'm happy yeah, where yeah. I am. I'm like doing a you know decent job. Like yeah. you know, I'll, I'll I'll get by. But I'm you know, That's it's hard to compare me to the people who act, like you know we we talked about in the past because they probably but it's live easy a very to drop different. Names. They're easy they, they, to drop those yeah, names. Yeah, you gotta look, you gotta look at them. Yeah, a bit more purposeful and drive a bit yeah. harder than I do. So hence the reason why they're there, and yeah. hence the reason why I'm not. But you know, I don't think I'm I'm unhappy with where I am. That's probably the important bit. I think that's definitely every, everything we could agree on. So I mean. It's been going on for a while. Um, you know, thanks for thanks for being on the show again. If there's uh, is there anything anything you want to say to anybody or just any shout out to uh, any any anything on your Twitter Instagram going on or? Well, no, my Instagram is private and I stopped tweeting a while ago. It was just like lots of noise. So not really on that front. I don't know. Uh, I... Any any junior product coming in? What the, what's the one thing that you want to tell them? These questions, it's hard to answer. I don't know, man. The one thing. Yeah, the, the answer could be I don't know. The answer could be. I would probably have to think about it. I'm not the guy who gives you like these spontaneous, out of nowhere, great answers. But so yeah, I mean, I the, the importance is on planning it. <laughs> the importance is just planning it. Anyways, thanks again. We'll. Catch, I mean, I'll see. I'll definitely see you around. Anyway, so all right. Thanks, Barry.